All right, good evening, Bethel Church. How are you guys doing tonight? I am doing great. Thank you for asking. I am reporting to you live from an empty sanctuary, and that never feels normal. But we do it because we love you. We cannot wait to see you again. And I am super excited about what we have for you tonight. We have an awesome, awesome presentation. So I'm just going to give a few minutes for the Facebook Live and the live stream to populate. Cruz, Denise, what's up? I see you. Tyler, what's up? You can feel free to leave a comment. Atif, faithful man of God, always gets on on time. We are really excited about the presentation that we have for you tonight. I actually saw this presentation 12, 13 years ago. And, and what's really cool about it is it introduced me to the idea that science and faith do not clash. And that's one of the biggest things that I think a lot of believers struggle with is scientific explanations to certain things. And of course, more than anything, we are called to live by faith, but it sure is awesome when you could get some scientific facts behind some of the things that, that we hold on to with faith. Uh, and to that end, we have uh, Dr. Brian Miller, who is going to be presenting something that I truly believe is going to blow your mind. So we're going to get started here in a couple of minutes. I'm going to hand it off to Pastor Mike and, and Dr. Brian Miller. But in the meantime, I just want you to prepare yourself, get your mind right, get your heart right, and really focus in on this. I know we've done a lot of content, so maybe you just play it in the background and do your thing and, you know, you're cooking dinner or you're watching the kids, which you have to watch the kids. But on this one, I would really, really say pay attention. Pay close attention. You could get some information that is super useful and super helpful. So we're excited. We're about to start. Oh, my wife just got on. What's up, May? Tofumi, what's up? Raphael, those are my in-laws in case you guys didn't know. Tofumi and Raphael are my brother and sister from another mister. So we're about to start. We got a couple of more minutes. I'm just waiting for it to populate. It is not too late to share. Bethel has been preparing some hot meals for you guys. We have been doing stuff almost daily, and it is not just meant for you to ingest, but it is also meant to share. And that's the easy part. All you have to do is share it. We'll prepare it. We'll do all the prayers. We'll do all of these presentations. Your part is to share it. So I, I super, super encourage you. There is still time to share this video. Share it on your feed. I know I've talked to a couple people who for some reason felt embarrassed because they think their feed is super cool. And I'm like, come on, your feed is not that cool. It just has a couple funny memes on it. That's it. This is really useful stuff. And I'm not against memes. I, I love memes. There's been some pretty funny uh, Rona memes. If you know what that means, you're laughing. If not, that's okay. Don't worry. We're going to keep on going. Brittany Clinton, I see you up there. Jorge, what is up? I think Shane Crowley, what's going on? Tony, what's up? Everybody say, what's up, Tony? <laughs> All right. So feel free to leave a comment. Not sure we're going to be answering any questions, but leave a comment. Let people know that you are here. We are super, super excited. We're about to jump in. I am going to hand it off to Pastor Mike here in about 30 seconds and prepare to have your mind blown. If you're just jumping on, like I said, we're producing a lot of content. Some of it you might have playing in the background. This is something that you definitely want in the foreground. You want to pay close attention tonight because tonight is going to be super useful and you're going to be able to see the connection between God and science. God and science do not clash. God created science. So we have Dr. Brian Miller. He is ready to go. You're going to learn some things that you've probably never even heard of about the Shroud of Turin. I know when I heard it 13, 14 years ago, it, it totally blew my mind. So I am super excited to be able to, along with Bethel, share this with you. And since we're sharing it with you, you should share it with other people. So just click share on your Facebook Live, on your live stream, and I am going to go ahead 
and hand it off to Pastor Mike. Enjoy. We have an exciting night tonight. We're going to be examining the Shroud of Turin tonight. And I have with me online right now uh, the genius, um, the, the man, the, the myth, the legend, uh, Dr. Brian Miller. So give it up for Dr. Brian Miller. Uh, he's joining us right now uh, from Seattle. So uh, he is here. Dr. Brian, welcome. Welcome, welcome. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. Well, Dr. Brian, I don't know if you remember this, but uh, 20 years ago, uh, we did a presentation at Vanderbilt University uh, together, and you wowed the students there in Nashville, Tennessee, as you did this presentation, as well as another presentation on, I think it was called um, uh, was faith, faith and science, science or, or what was, was it? Do you remember what, what other? It was probably on faith and science and the evidence for a creator in physics and chemistry, astronomy, and different things like that. Yes, absolutely amazing. So 20 years ago, it was year 2000, and uh, man, you, you look the same. In fact, I, I look the same too. We've aged pretty good in 20 years. And uh, so I am so excited about tonight and everyone that's joining us to watch this presentation as we kick off Passion Week. Um, what an uh, amazing um, presentation and opportunity we have to have you uh, from Seattle with us uh, tonight. And uh, so uh, I don't want to take too much time. Maybe just share a little bit about your journey and how you you've gotten to Seattle and just even your own little, your faith journey. Uh, you, I know you got your doctorate at Duke um, in, in, what was it in physics? Yeah, it was in complex systems physics. So in, 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 the, in the science world, are, isn't that, um, that study kind of like at the top of the food chain as well? Not that you want to toot your own horn, but you're really smart. You're a smart, smart guy. Yeah. I've, I've, many people would argue that the physics would be at the top of the level of theoretical abstraction and ingenuity. So yeah, we, I'm, I'm in a good field. <laughs> That's fantastic. So share a little bit about your, your journey um, and uh, maybe a little bit of your faith journey um, and then you know, your educational journey. Uh, sure, and they're, they're sort of intertwined because I um, w was raised in the church, but I wasn't really prepared for the challenges I'd received coming to college uh, against my faith. And I went to MIT undergraduate, and uh, I became pretty convinced that the Christian faith was just a psychological crutch. A uh, part of that was reading Richard Dawkins, people like uh, skeptics, and just a lot of attacks against my faith in different contexts. And I remember uh, in my room, I said, God, I don't know what's true but I'm a scientist. I just can't believe things blindly. So whatever's true, you just help me to find the truth and I'll follow it. And, and that was sort of put me on a long journey. And a part of that journey was through the issue of science, because the question was, is science, uh, does the evidence from science point to a creator or does it point to the idea that we're the blind product of the blind forces of nature? And obviously the evidence points to the fact that there is a creator. Uh, and then the second issue was, is the Christian faith true? Did Jesus really rise from the dead? Because it, it really is, the, the Christian faith makes extraordinary claims. Like it claims that there's a personal God that created everything, a God who created us, and that that God came to earth as Jesus to reveal himself to humanity. And it's, it's an incredible story. And my heart was, was captured by it. But then I had to ask, is it true? And the big question is really the resurrection. Because if Jesus actually died and rose from the dead, then that means he really was who he said he was. It means he really was God's image on earth, that his message was true, and that we have hope that when we die, we too will rise from the dead as he promises. So that put me on a long journey. And I studied history and archaeology and different things like that. And what I came to realize is that the evidence for the resurrection is overwhelming. And there's amazing scholars, people like Gary Habermas has written a lot about what's called the minimal facts, that if you look at um, even the facts that skeptics recognize, skept uh, facts like the fact that the tomb was empty after Jesus died, the fact that he died by crucifixion, the fact that his disciples believed that they'd seen him after he rose from the dead, 
the fact that his brother James uh, was a skeptic, but then believed he saw him after he rose from the dead. The fact that Paul, who was a skeptic, believed that he had seen Jesus after he rose from the dead. If you look at all these facts, it really points incontrovertibly to the reality that Jesus really did rise from the dead. So that was really extraordinary. And while I was going through my journey of exploration, the last issue I came across was the issue of the Shroud of Turin. And I'll talk about that in great depth, but it's really the burial cloth of Jesus. And it actually is purported to have an image produced by the radiation from the resurrection. So it's basically like a photo, it's like a photograph of the resurrection. And that was really extraordinary because um, I knew one of the world experts on the Shroud, Dr. Alan Wanger and his wife, Mary Wanger, who's a co-researcher. And God providentially brought me in their past. So I would see this evidence that really spoke to me as a physicist. So in my journey back to faith, a lot of it was through my academic studies, through studying science. I got a PhD in, in physics. Uh, and part of it was really encountering God personally, where God would guide my life, where he would uh, touch me with his love and kindness, and even seeing the extraordinary answers to prayer just through our sister church in North Carolina. Uh, so really, it was all these things that brought me back to faith. And after that point, I really felt, uh, I, had, I felt I had a calling from God to help others see the truth of the faith. Because many people are told at university that the Christian faith just doesn't have any evidence to support it. And that is completely false. And what I do is I now work for Discovery Institute, which is a, a think tank that deals with the issue of science and basically how science points to design in the world. So I've been in Seattle for the last three years doing that. So I've had a chance to interact with some of the top scientists in the world. And what's happening in science is more and more people are realizing that the evidence from science is pointing to a designer. So that's just kind of my journey. That's how I ended up in Seattle. And I just look forward to sharing with your, with your congregation tonight. That's fantastic. And we are so excited now. So 20 years ago, um, saw a, a presentation on the Shroud. So 20 years later, doctor, you're still a believer. Oh, you're yeah. still a believer yes. uh, after a just continued study um, so I'm really excited, and, and so are all of our viewers tonight, um, to hear uh, what you have to say about the Shroud of Turin, the, the burial cloth of Jesus. So at this time, uh, I think we've had a lot more people join us and give us some uh, more time. Uh, everybody who's joined, uh, I've got Dr. Brian Miller up in Seattle with us tonight, and uh, he's a physicist, got his, uh, his PhD from Duke. Um, and, uh, and he is going to present tonight. So let's give it up for Dr. Brian Miller. Uh, thank you. This, this really is one of my uh, favorite topics, the, the Shroud of Turin. And what I want to do is I want to start by talking about two of the people that really helped me on this journey. And that's Drs. Alan Wanger, Mary Wanger. And I mentioned them before, but I just want to give them honor because with Alan Wanger, uh, he was a professor of medicine at Duke University, and he spent decades with his wife, Mary, as co-researchers studying the Shroud. And they've done a lot of the pioneering studies that really helped to bring this evidence to the public. So a lot of the work I'll be presenting is from them. And I've also more recently had a chance to go to a conference on the Shroud with some more of the, the, the more recent uh, stars in the scientific realm in terms of the Shroud of Turin. So I'll talk some of their, about some of their research also. But for those of you that aren't familiar with the Shroud of Turin, uh, Shroud just means a burial cloth, and it's called the, the Shroud of Turin because it's currently in Turin, Italy. And the Shroud is simply the, the cloth that Jesus was buried in. If you remember, the Gospels talk about how Joseph of Arimathea uh, dedicated a shroud uh, or burial, burial cloth to, for Jesus to be buried in, and that's, that is what the Shroud is. And it's, it's actually a cloth which is about uh, four meters long and about one meter wide. And what happened was this, this, as this picture depicts, is it went around his back, it started his feet, it went around his back, it wrapped over his head, and then went over his front. So that's how Jesus was buried, was in the shroud. And what happened is after Jesus was taken down from the cross, he initially had a, he had a um, face cloth put on him, and then the face cloth was removed, and then uh, he was taken with the shroud to the tomb with the face cloth and other cloths that were involved. And if you remember in the Gospel of John, it talks about how Peter and John uh, ran to the tomb and they looked in, they saw the burial claws, the claws being the shroud and the face cloth and probably a chin strap. And they saw and they believed. And that's where the Gospels talk about the, the, the Shroud of Turin. 
Uh, and that's where it ends. But what happens is um, you can study the shroud and how it's uh, been moved throughout history. And I'll talk about that historical overview. But I want to just talk a little bit about just the physical appearance of the shroud, because this is the cloth. And it's a cloth that you can actually see in Trinidad. It comes out every 20 years or so. And here, what you see is uh, towards the left is the frontal view of the person in the shroud, the, the man in the shroud. You see the face, you see the body, you see the hands in a modesty position, you see the legs. Um, and the, uh, towards the right, you see the back of Jesus. You see the back image where you have blood stains, you've got other uh, faint images, which I'll talk about. But also I want you to notice that there's these, these black lines on the top and the bottom in four black patches. Now that wasn't originally in the shroud. What happened is there was a fire in the, uh, uh, in the 1500s and the shroud was in a, a silver box which melted and the silver burned right through the cloth. It was folded in eight pieces, which is why you see those patches. And then it was sewed back together. So don't worry about those patches and those black lines that wasn't part of the original shroud. We're not really gonna address that. Now, many people thought the shroud was a hoax because of a carbon dating that was done in 1988. And what happened is there's actually an earlier sample taken in 1973. It was taken from uh, the uh, upper corner of the shroud and the 1973 sample, they cut into two pieces and one sample dated to about 200 AD, one dated to about 1000 AD. So they, this, they knew this was gonna be very difficult to date, that there was something very strange going on here. So they took a sample in 1988 and um, a team of researchers uh, told them that they needed to take, use a very complex protocol, a lot of fail safe methods to date this properly. And what happened was the entire protocol was abandoned and they took that one sample in what was actually one of the most contaminated pieces of the cloth. And here's actually a videotape of the sample. And what you'll notice is there's actually a seam running through the sample. So what people started eventually realized is it seems like there's some contamination in the sample. So the carbon dating that was done in 1988 originally showed that the shroud appeared to have been uh, created in the Middle Ages, but because of the contamination that people are concerned about, this, the carbon dating has been largely rejected by those who are most familiar with the data. So that's really brought in a, a huge resurgence of interest in the shroud in the last several years. Now, we can actually trace the shroud all the way back to the tomb. And there is a man named Ian Wilson that's done a historical reconstruction. And what I'll do is I'll give you a brief overview of his, 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 historical, his historical reconstruction of the path of the shroud through history. And I'm not a historian, so I'm just gonna present this to you. And people might quibble over a detail here. They might feel there was some other uh, twist and turns here or there. But what I'll talk about is why this basic overview is probably true. And I'll give the scientific evidence for that. But this historical reconstruction was uh, reconstructed by historians. It was based on both legends and myths and historical records, uh, records from the city of, of Edessa, which I'll talk about. And this was the reconstruction. So the basic idea is that after Jesus died and rose from the dead, there was a king in Edessa named Abgar V. And legend has it that this king actually sent a letter to Jesus asking him to visit Edessa. And this, I believe, was talked about by uh, Eusebius, who was a church historian. He believed these stories were true. People will debate it. But what does seem to be the case is it seems likely that what happened is after the resurrection, a disciple took the burial cloth, the shroud, and took it to Edessa. And what they did was they actually folded this, this uh, cloth into eight pieces and then put a picture frame around it so that you could just simply see the face of Jesus on this cloth, the face of the image. And it, it was eventually called the Holy Mendelian. So if you look at the Holy Mendelian through history, that is very likely what the shroud was. So uh, what happened was the, this disciple took the image to Edessa and preached the gospel. And the king of Edessa, Abgar V, became a Christian. And what happened is he declared Edessa the first Christian city. And what they did is they actually took uh, a copy of the face and, put in, and basically painted a copy of the face on the shroud uh, on a plaque and put that over the city gate. And that was common because in, in cities, they would typically have uh, idols to their deities. So the king of, of uh, Edessa became a Christian. So he destroyed the city God and then put this image of Jesus in its place. 
And what happened is Edessa was lo along a lot of trade routes. So people would come from far and wide. They'd hear the story of Jesus. They'd see this image. And then they would actually copy the image and take it with them. Well, what happened was the king of Edessa was not a Christian. So he started to persecute the Christians. So uh, what happened was the Christians took the shroud and also took the, the image, the copy, and put it in a niche above the city gate. And what took place is it was lost to history for several hundred years. And then in the sixth century or so, what happened is a flood damaged the city. And during the reconstruction, it was, it was actually uh, rediscovered. So the, the Holy Mendelian, as it was called, is, it came back into viewing in the sixth century. It stayed in that area in Edessa for several hundred years. And eventually around uh, the time of the, the Muslim invasions, the Muslims captured Edessa and took control of the city. And then about the 10th century or so, the uh, emperor from Constantinople, the Byzantine Empire, sent an army to surround the city of Edessa. And then they took the shroud from Edessa with other artifacts and took it bought back to Constantinople, which was, which was the uh, head of the Western Byzantine Empire, the Western Roman Empire. And then what took place, it stayed there until the Crusaders came. And then sometime, oh, in the 1200s or so, the Crusaders sacked the city, and then they took the shroud from Constantinople up into Lyre, France. People think it may have been uh, the Deshaney family that did this. And then it came up into public viewing uh, around 1350 or so, 1357, it came back to public viewing. And eventually it, it ended up back in Turin, Italy, and it was eventually willed to the Catholic Church. So that's just sort of a quick history of the shroud. And what's really very fascinating is that this history has uh, been confirmed by evidence from the shroud itself, because there's actually these images of flowers on the shroud, and I'll talk about those images later, and also pollen samples that were discovered by Max Fry. And the, and the pollen samples and the images of flowers correspond and this particular combination of flowers, what you find is several of the flowers uh, are from the area of Jerusalem, that basic area. In fact, if you look at all the flowers, some of the flowers grow that far south and further north. Some will, will grow that far north and then further south. But they're the only place in the world where you really have all that combination of flowers is around the area of Jerusalem. Uh, there's also some, some pollen from the area of, of modern-day Turkey, which is around where Constantinople is, and then some from Europe. So the pollen samples and the flowers confirm that this uh, shroud was from, in Jerusalem, at least some part of its history. So that's really interesting. Uh, also, what's fascinating is if you look at the trade routes, uh, some of the trade routes go to the city of Edessa, and then some of the trade routes go to the city of Dear Europa, which was a bit to the south. And as I mentioned, people would take the image of the shroud, the image of the face of Jesus from, from Edessa, and take it with him because the East was very much into icons and images. That was a really big deal back then, considering a lot of people were literate. Well, what happened at that time period was there was this massive transformation of art. Because before that time, what took place is a lot of the images of deities would be in profile, meaning that you would see them from the side. But what happened is after the story of Jesus started to spread uh, about a God who wasn't distant, but actually involved in the world, a lot of the people wanted to uh, re-image their deities to sound more like Jesus. And what's fascinating is the first pictures you see of deities with frontal view was after the story of Jesus was spread. And if you look at the first depiction of Zeus in full frontal view, it looks like it was actually copied from the Shroud of Turin. As I mentioned, it was in the city of Europa, which is very much along the trade routes connecting to Edessa. Now, uh, Dr. Alan Wanger, I mentioned, came up with an amazing technique to compare images. It's called the polarized image overlay technique. What he did was he took two images, he would uh, cross-polarize them with cross-polarized cross light, and then you could move with a polarizer from one image to the other and see exactly where lines and curves match up. That's called a point of convergence. That's where lines and points match up, or a point of congruence. And what happened is he did this with the image of Zeus, Zeus Kyrios, in Europa, and the image of the face of Jesus. And what he found was the images matched very nicely. In fact, there's 79 points of congruence between the images. That's lines where they match. And in a court of law, it takes about 60 points of congruence to prove that two images are the same. So what you see is that the first depiction of Zeus in frontal view was copied from the shroud, 
And this is around 31 AD when this image was produced. So I'm obviously promoting the idea that Jesus resurrected around 30 AD. That's the date that, that fits with the story. Uh, but that's not all. If you, if you look throughout uh, the spread of Christianity, if you go even to, to India, what you find is the Indian uh, religions changed after the Christians got there. They wanted to make them more like the Christian faith. So this idea of a, of a personal God that came to earth became very attractive. So what they did was before that time, people never depicted Buddha in full frontal view. The first depiction of Buddha, where you can see the faith, was around the second century. And again, the image appears to be copied right from the shroud. You see the wide staring eyes, you see the elongated nose, you have a beard with a, with a piece torn out. So again, this image was, was being copied. And that's true throughout the Middle Ages. If you look at, let's say, the sixth century after the image um, was rediscovered in Edessa, you find that these icons and coins appear to have been copied from the shroud. And the number of points of congruence is so large that it's very clear and, and definitive that the shroud was indeed the template used to make these images. In fact, there's a lot of similarities between the shroud and different icons and different coins, but the icons and coins don't resemble each other nearly as much. So it was clear that the shroud was the source of these images, going back to like the sixth century. In fact, here's Christ the Pontecrator, a uh, sixth century icon, and has 170 points of congruence. So clearly the shroud was the template for this. Um, now that's really interesting with the historical evidence. But again, as a scientist, what I really, really am excited about is, the, is more of the scientific evidence. I'll start with the medical evidence, because what happened is forensic pathologists who studied the shroud have noticed lots of blood stains. In fact, it's type AB blood that they've, they've discovered. And what they found is that the uh, blood stains point to uh, a lot of trauma that Jesus experienced, which perfectly matches the Gospels. So for instance, you remember how Jesus was scourged? And a scourge essentially was like a, like, a, like a staff with leather straps with bone and metal tied to it. And it, what it would do, it, was, it, it would create very deep lacerations in the individual. In fact, if you've seen the, um, uh, Mel Gibson's movie on Jesus, it was very accurate the way they portrayed that. And if you look on the shroud, what you find is both on the back and the front, you see sets of two and three dumbbell-shaped uh, lacerations which perfectly match what you'd expect from a Roman scourge. Um, also, it, you, you, what's interesting about this is if you look at where the scourge marks are, you see it throughout the back and the front, but it's not over the heart. And that's typical with the Roman scourging because the Roman soldiers wanted to torture the individual, but they didn't want to kill the individual. So they wouldn't go for the heart area because that could kill the individual. So again, this looks just like a Roman scourging. Also, if you recall that Jesus had a crown of thorns placed on him, and if you look around the shroud area, both around the front and the back of the head, you see these puncture wounds where you have blood flows that perfectly match what you'd expect from a very deep puncture wound from something like a very thick crown. So again, you have very clear medical evidence of the crown of thorns. Also, uh, you remember how Jesus had a cross that he carried. It probably wasn't exactly like this. It may have been just a cross beam. Uh, and also how he was crucified. And what happens is in crucifixion is you've got nails hammered through the wrists to support the individual and then through the feet. And the, the gospels talk about the hands but the Greek for, word for hand also includes the forearm. So this fits fine with the gospels. And uh, what you uh, find on the shroud is you see these puncture wounds through the wrist and puncture wounds through the feet that very well match what you'd expect on, uh, from a crucifixion. In fact, also if you look on the arms, you notice that there's blood stains that are from blood dripping down the arms and the angle of the blood flow is what you'd expect from an individual in a crucified position. Um, also, if you look on the side, and this is partly covered by a patch that was sewn in after the fire that I mentioned, what you really see on the side is what looks like a separation of blood and uh, blood serum, some sort of clear fluid. And again, this perfectly matches the Gospel of John that talks about how when the soldier speared Jesus, there was blood and water that came out. And the water was some sort of a body fluid. And again, this perfectly matches what you see in the Shroud of Turin. Um, so what you find is pretty much every single detail that's described in the Gospels perfectly matches what you find on the Shroud. Things like lacerations on the back from the cross beam, uh, uh, skin knees when Jesus fell, it's all there. 
uh, and, and, and it's really it's really important to realize that no forager from the Middle Ages could possibly have recreated a Roman crucifixion and scourging. That's just ridiculous. So this is clearly coming from the time of the Romans in the first few centuries. But what's even more amazing is not the medical evidence. But when you look at the body image, it's, it's really extraordinary because there's an image produced on the shroud that's not from the blood. It's not from body fluids. It, it's a very faint image. And what happens is when scientists have studied this, in fact, the, there was a team called Stirrup that studied the shroud in depth in the 1970s. You had physicists, chemists, microscopists, and they spent over 100,000 hours studying this object. So it's one of the most studied objects on Earth in using non-invasive testing. And what they concluded is some pretty amazing stuff. First of all, it looks like the shroud acts like a photographic negative because you've got an image on the shroud where the, uh, where the fibers are chemically changed. And if you take the photographic negative, you can actually see the image more clearly. So it's almost like a photographic plate. You, you may not be familiar with photographic plates in the, in the modern age of digital cameras, but, but back in the day, people used to have chemical plates. And when the light hit the plate, it would chemically alter the plate and produce an image. So the, photo, the, the shroud looks like a photographic negative, essentially. Now, there's also this really amazing uh, uh, physical features of the shroud. First of all, chemically, it's not paint. The image is not paint. It's not a paint pigment. What the image is produced by is it looks like radiation because it's simply a chemical decomposition, dehydration of the very, very surface of the fibrils, like only a few microns thick. That's like a thousandth of a centimeter. So what you have is what it looks like chemical, it looks like radiation has chemically altered the shroud. It's kind of like if you take a t-shirt in the sun or a newspaper, the radiation from the sun will chemically alter the fibers. That's what the image is produced by. It looks like radiation. But what's really amazing is that if you look at the density of the image, that's the dots per square inch, almost like a photograph, almost like a, a picture from a magazine, is that the image is denser uh, where it appears that the cloth was closer to the body. So it seems like the, the, the uh, cloth was above the body. It was flat. It wasn't draped like this image was, but it was flat. And it looks like what happened is the radiation went from the body in a straight line in columns right to the image of the, uh, uh, right to the cloth. So that the nose was closer to the cloth, so it's a denser image. The cheeks were further away, so it was a less dense image because the coloration of the shroud is the same everywhere. Like the color is the same, it's just there's more dots per square inch in certain parts. So when uh, people took an, a NASA scanner called the VP8 and they scanned this thing, you get this very three-dimensional relief where you have the image on the cloth contains the three-dimensional contours of the face because of, that's because the radiation left the body and went to the cloth. And what happens is when radiation goes through air, it attenuates, which means it becomes less intense. So if you shine a flashlight through a, a foggy room, the flashlight looks like it's less and less intense as you go through, if you go through the air. In the same way, when the radiation left the body in a straight line and went from the body to the cloth, the radiation that had a shorter distance to go was more intense. So that's why there's more dots per square inch. So this is really extraordinary because that's not supposed to happen physically. Radiation is supposed to go in all directions, spherically, but in this case, it was like, uh, like millions of little laser beams that left the body and went in straight lines to produce the image. That's pretty extraordinary. And that's why if you take the plus image and you superimpose the plus image with the minus image, the photographic negative, and you slightly offset it, you get this very eerie three-dimensional effect of the face. And I'll call this the three-dimensional enhanced mode, which I'll talk about a bit more in detail. Well, what happens is part of what produced this radiation, at least to some extent, has been uh, analyzed by Dr. Alan Wanger. And what he realized was that if you look at the image in the eye, uh, it looks like there's actually uh, the image of a coin. And there's actually, I believe, a theologian named Phyllis that thought about this too. So what happened is he compared the image over the eye to various coins from the first century. And he found it looks like there was a coin in the eye, which was a lepton of Pontius Pilate. So this is a coin that was uh, minted in 29 AD. 
Now what happened back in that time period is if people died in shock, their eyelids would remain open, which is really creepy. So people would point coins or pottery in the eye to keep the eye shut. So it looks like because Jesus died in trauma, his eyes were open. So the soldiers put these coins in the eyes and what happened is that coin left an image on the shroud. In fact, here's actually the image of the eye with, a, with some very uh, standard uh, image uh, enhancement features. And what you see is the letters C-A-I. And that's part of the spelling, or it's actually part of a misspelling on the coin of Caesar. So you see this is a, a minted coin. You can see the letters. And the letters were produced again by the radiation. In fact. These little uh, red circles represent points of congruence where the image on the shroud matched the image from the coin. Now, uh, on this coin, uh, Dr. Wanger found 70 points, 74 points of congruence. And I mentioned that it takes about 60 to prove two images are the same. So that's really conclusive. But he also took other coins and he actually reversed the image of the coin and he superimposed it. And he found only about 10 points of congruence or 12. So clearly, that these leptons are the type of the coin that was actually put in the eye of Jesus. In fact, he actually found a coin that was a die mate to the coin in the eye of Jesus, meaning it was produced by the same die, because you can see the same die defect, I believe it's over on the, on the left side. So what's also interesting is if you look at where on the coin an image was produced on the shroud, it's where the coin was jagged or raised or irregular. And then that really makes it pretty obvious what the image is, or at least if you have a PhD in physics, it makes it pretty obvious that you're dealing with something like a coronal discharge. And a coronal discharge means that there was a massive buildup of voltage on the surface. So electric charge built up, and then when uh, it discharged through the air, a lot like this Van de Graaff generator. So that was part of the image producing process. It looks like there was a massive buildup of electric charge, which uh, emitted from the body to the cloth. And that's what produced that image of the eye. In fact, remember I talked about how you had um, the images from the flowers? Well, uh, Dr. Wanger actually took images of the flowers and he put it on a cloth and he, he charged these, these, um, the voltage up to several million volts and he produced a discharge. And the image produced on the cloth from the flowers was the same basic chemical and physical nature as the flower images we see on the shroud. So these flower images, again, from this electric discharge on the, on the cloth. Now, um, what Dr. Wenger also did is he took the coin, not the actual coin in Jesus' eye, obviously, but a, a copy of the coin, this lepton, put it in a, uh, on a cloth. He, he put it in, uh, he had, uh, or actually a physicist did this, and he charged the coin to several million volts to produce a discharge. And again, the chemical nature was very similar. Well, this has been analyzed by um, people that Dr. Wanger knows, like a, like a Dr. Benson, who worked for GE High Voltage. And they estimated that the electric voltage required to produce an image on the shroud would be on the order of hundreds of millions of volts. So the amount of energy uh, that was emitted from the body was like a lightning bolt, which, which is really, really quite dramatic. Now, also, what happened is uh, Dr. Wanger noticed that the images on the cloth in the three-dimensionally enhanced mode, that's like the plus and minus image superimposed and offset, were not actually the images of hands, but they're actually the image of bones. So what you can actually see in the shroud is you can actually see the bones in the wrist and the hands of the man in the shroud. So you're seeing the world's first x-ray where you can actually see the bones in the wrist and the hand. Well, equally striking, if you look at the face, um, and what I have on the left is actually the enhanced mode of the, the, the shroud image, the, the plus and minus image, so it's in a three-dimensional effect. On the right, you actually see a, uh, a skeleton just from a textbook, and what you find is the image of the face of the shroud is actually an x-ray of the skull. You can clearly see the, uh, the eye cavity, the sinus cavities, the nasal cavities. You can actually see the teeth and the roots of the teeth. In fact, Dr. Wanger had a, had a radiologist from Duke University to examine this and confirm that you're really dealing with an x-ray, both of the hands and the face. So the question becomes, well, how on earth will that happen? Because what I want to do is I want to show you a little video of what this looked like. So here's a video. And this shows you um, the shroud as you have it uh, laid on top of Jesus. And again, it was flat. Um, and some people think it's flat because some mysterious process flattened it like this. 
Other people think there may have been some other objects like flowers and, and other materials here that raised it up. But some way it looks like the, the, the cloth was flat. And what you find is there's like this plane and then radiation was emitted from the cloth both up and down, which is why you actually see the x-ray image um, on the cloth. And, and what happens is you have this very complex process. And we don't know what happened because you can't reproduce resurrections. But what you, there are physicists like a Dr. Trend from University of Toronto, uh, people like um, Bob Rooker, who've looked at this, and they think what took place is it seems as if the atoms in the body literally came apart. That's one theory. And then that caused the electrons to go to the surface of the body, which ca caused the coronal discharge. And in that process, what you have is x-rays are emitted and possibly even neutron radiation. In fact, um, um, Bob Rucker is a physicist, and he looked at those carbon dating samples I mentioned, and something very interesting happened. If you look at the 1988 sample, it was broken into three pieces, and it was sent to three different labs. And what happened was the datings of the three samples were so different that it appeared they weren't even the same sample. And that's consistent with neutron radiation, because if you have radiation that leaves the body, then some of these samples would have received more neutron radiation than others, which is, would have artificially enhanced the carbon-14, which is why they did it differently. Uh, if you don't understand that, just recognize something really cool happened, radiation was released, and that's what messed up perhaps the carbon dating. Now, what does that mean? Well, obviously, normal human bodies don't dematerialize and emit large amounts of radiation. And that's really where science ends and faith begins. So if you are a Christian, it makes perfect sense because the resurrection where Jesus' body was transformed, he had a new form, it would make sense to release all this radiation. If you're not a Christian, you could argue for time travelers or aliens or the Star Trek Enterprise. But if you're not willing to go to those kind of crazy extremes, then you have a real problem. And this is really significant because that brings us back to the final question. Why is this significant? Well, it's significant because what this represents is physical evidence of the resurrection, like a photograph. Now, if, you don't, if you're not a physicist and you're not really into this, no, that's fine. There's lots and lots of other historical evidence that points to the fact that Jesus rose from the dead. There's also lots of evidence that Christians in the name of Jesus have prayed for the sick and see them healed in Jesus' name. That's like Craig Keener's work in his book on miracles. So the evidence is clear. But what, this is so, what was so significant to me was this reminds me of like the story of Thomas, because Thomas was a skeptic. He was the empiricist. He said, I will not believe unless I can touch the wounds in his hand and touch the wound in his side. It makes sense because Thomas was a twin. So people probably got him confused with his brother growing up. So they thought maybe it wasn't really Jesus who rose from the dead. They just saw somebody else. So Thomas wanted to see physical evidence. And Jesus appeared to him. And he allowed Thomas to touch the wounds in his wrist and the wounds in his, his side. And that's kind of like people like me who was a physicist. This speaks to me very powerfully. I hope it speaks to a lot of you that may be in the medicine or science or history. Uh, but that's the key point. Because the problem with knowing God, the problem with knowing Christ is not the evidence. We're not, God is not the one who's lost, we are. And the beauty is if people turn to God in humility, God will reach out to them and give them whatever they need to believe. For me, it was historical evidence. It was scientific evidence. For some people, it's a supernatural healing. For others, it's the beauty of the faith. But the key point is God is more than able to reveal the truth, but the problem is people's pride and rebellion. The first step is humility, surrendering, and knowing that Jesus is Lord of the universe, and then God will help you to come to faith if your heart is fully given to him. Secondly, what this really shows us is it shows us the supernatural power of the Christian faith. Because what Paul said, uh, an early Christian named Paul, a leader of the church who wrote a lot of the New Testament, he said the same power that rose Jesus from the dead is the same power that works in us. And that's really encouraging because for those of us who encounter Jesus, it's not just, we're not encountering a theological ideas, we're not encountering the rules of more, just a bunch of moral rules. We're encountering the living God that's at work within us. And the same power that rose from God is the same power in us transforming us. And that's exciting. I encourage you, if you haven't experienced that, enter Christian community, call out to God, and believe for a faith that's transformative. And finally, it gives us true hope.
because not only does this really show us that Jesus' words were true, but it shows us that we have the hope of eternal life because people say, well, no one's been to heaven, so we don't know what the afterlife is, but that's not the case. Jesus uh, went to the Father back into that communion of the Trinity, and he came back to show us that heaven is real and we can know God and we will rise from the dead. Thank you. Wow. Doctor, that was fantastic. Thank you. Um, again, 20 years later, uh, your presentation only gets better. And um, 20 years later, Dr. Brian, you and I are still believers. Now, you're a lot smarter than I'm sure you were, were even 20 years ago. Um, and hopefully I, I've learned a few things, but uh, I wanted to read a scripture, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, and how Paul writes about the, the, the resurrection and how if the resurrection didn't happen, then what we believe doesn't matter. It's foolishness, right? And so, I mean, he, he, he bases, I mean, the, our whole faith on a moment of history. And so if you can disprove this moment of history, then our faith is disproved, right? And so this isn't a, you know, tonight's not a, okay, the proof that uh, even though I believe that the Shroud of Turin is really the burial cloth of Jesus, right? I, I believe that, like you. Um, but uh, what we're talking uh, about uh, and what Paul's talking about is the actual historic fact that Jesus rose again. And so I want to read this passage and then get a couple of your thoughts and then we'll kind of close up. And maybe you could even um, think about, as I read this, just um, some thoughts or some questions you get asked after a presentation yeah. like this. Yeah. Um, and so 1 Corinthians chapter 15, Paul writes, verse 12, the message we preach is Christ who has been raised from the dead. So how can any, of you possibly say there is no resurrection of the dead. For if there is no such thing as resurrection of the dead, then not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, all of our preaching has been done for nothing, and your faith is useless. Moreover, moreover, if the dead are not raised, that would mean that we are false witnesses who are misrepresenting God, and that would mean that we have preached a lie, stating that God raised him from the dead, if in reality he didn't. Verse 16, if the dead aren't raised up, that would mean that Christ has not been raised up either. And if Christ is not alive, you are still lost in your sins, and your faith is a fantasy. It would also mean that those believers in Christ who have passed away have simply perished. If the only benefit of our hope in Christ is limited to this life on earth, we deserve to be pitied more than all others. So the fact that our, our faith as Christians, I mean, it rests on this moment of the resurrection. And it's significant in that um, it, it shows that the, the miracle of uh, of, of resurrection life, the, the, the miracle of life after death, uh, the miracle of um, defeating, um, defeating death, right? And uh, I mean, so much, you know, is found there we can unpack for a while, but um, just maybe you can touch on this, this verse, but then even other questions that you get asked after a presentation like this. Uh, yeah, certainly. So, um... Uh, you're absolutely right, is that the, the resurrection is the key issue. If Jesus rose from the dead, the Christian faith is true, and we need to surrender our lives to him because he's worthy. He's the Lord of the creation. No question about that. Um, uh, some questions that people could bring up are the issues of can we really trust the evidence for the resurrection? Like people would say, maybe it's all a hoax. Maybe the disciples uh, just made up the stories. Well, the problem is no serious historian believes that because the disciples went to their death. Uh, many of them have been recorded going to their death, like Peter, Paul, James, and they did not recant. And you'll find a lot of people in history that will die for what they 
believe is true, but you will not find people in history that will die for what they believe is a lie. That's what's really key. Another people, another people thing people will say, well, maybe it was just a hallucination. Maybe they were confused. I don't know if you've seen the new, new uh, Star Wars, but maybe it was just sort of the Jedi Jesus, sort of this apparition like Luke Skywalker. And what's really clear is that disciples did not believe they encountered an apparition of Jesus. They encountered him physically. That's really key. They ate with him. They touched him. Uh, they walked with him. He appeared in a room with them. So what you're finding is that this whole idea that it was just an apparition cannot possibly be true. Others say maybe they were just delusional. Uh, but again, people don't have mass group delusions or hallucinations of the same thing. So that's a common question. Is there, is there other explanations? And the answer is no. The resurrection is the only explanation for what really took place. Um, another big issue is why should I care? Like, okay, so Jesus rose from the dead. What's the big deal? Well, one thing that it shows us is the serious nature of the human condition, that Jesus went to the cross, died, and suffered for our sins. What that tells us is that our separation from God, our rebellion against God, was very, very severe. And Jesus came and died on the cross in our place, that our rebellion from God resulted in our death, our alienation from God. Jesus took all of that evil, that suffering, that rebellion, that, that judgment on himself and defeated it, took the penalty for it, and then rose from the dead. So what it does is it brings us to humility, knowing how serious the human condition is, how much we're separated from God, and the lengths that God went to to reunite us with him. That's really significant also. Also, what's amazing is the resurrection uh, it's fascinating because if you, if you look at um, Jesus and John, he rises and he's in a garden. Well, who else was in the garden? Adam and Eve. So what you have is Jesus rising from the dead means a new world has begun. And what that means is that Christianity isn't meant to be just a set of moral rules. And there's obviously guidelines, but it's meant to be entering an entire new kingdom, an entire new adventure, an entire new path in life. It's kind of like when uh, Obi-Wan Kenobi invites Luke Skywalker to become part of this cosmic battle. And that's what's so exciting for me is that God has brought me out of a mundane, meaningless life, saved me, forgiven me, adopted me, and brought me into an adventure with eternal impact on the world around us. So my hope is for the people watching this in Easter, if you're in kind of a, a mundane life, a mundane faith where Christianity is kind of compartmentalized, let this be the, the point where you leave um, nominal Christianity and enter into the adventure God has for you and let his power work in you to fill you with his, his power, give you spiritual gifts so that you too can go out in the world and transform lives. So there's some thoughts that I had. Fantastic. Uh, doctor, thank you. It really um, you know, sets us up uh, this this week, Passion Week, um, as we're um, looking at Jesus's his his last week of, of life on Earth before the um, death, burial, and resurrection that we we celebrate our, our faith and um, you know this this Easter we're starting a new series called uh, Made New, oh, okay. and uh, and so uh, you know those that are watching right now, I just want to take an, an opportunity um, to just share a couple last thoughts before we say goodbye to Dr. Brian and give thanks to him. But, uh, you know, if you're watching t today, tonight, or um, uh, recording later, I um, want you to know this, that uh, the Bible tells us in John 3, 16, that God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. And that whosoever would believe in him would not perish, but have everlasting life. And in John chapter 1, uh, verse 12, it says, Yet to as many that received him and believed, um, he gave the right uh, to become sons of God. See, God, our creator, wants us to be made new and to be a part of his family. And uh, sin, you know, the uh, Bible um, calls uh, those things that are... Um, that are selfish, uh, those things that God um, doesn't want us to do, uh, has separated us from, from God. And Jesus came 2,000 years ago to live the life that we were supposed to live, but we couldn't. And then he died the death that we all deserve to die on the cross. And then he was buried and then he resurrected. 
and uh, what was even also significant about that is that's what Jesus said was going to happen. He, he predicted uh, his, his death, how he was going to die, um, the burial, and on the third day, raise again. And um, I can't explain to you just how he does it. Um, I think Dr. Brian, even as brilliant as he is, um, you know, there's this mystery of God opened our eyes. We, 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 we've seen facts. Uh, we've seen some evidence, and um, yet that caused us to take a, a step of faith that has changed us, has made us new, has made us believers, because we've received Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior. And I, I believe tonight, um, you know, there's a, there's a polling. You're not here on accident um, watching. Uh, maybe you've drifted away in your faith with God, or maybe you've never fully come to a full um, receiving of Jesus. But tonight is, um, was, is, an, is an opportunity for you um, because he's inviting you. Jesus is inviting you to uh, accept him and receive him as your Lord and Savior. And uh, he makes uh, all things new. He makes you new. And it's the miracle, the, the same power, the resurrection power that we believe um, took place on the third day when Christ was raised from the dead. That same power comes inside of us. And, and changes us and makes all things new. And God says he forgives all of our sins. Um, and uh, he, he writes our names in the Lamb's Book of Life, which, which means um, he's got a home for us that we, because of that, because of what Jesus did, and because we've received that, we have a home um, that we are very hopeful. And right now in this time, in this uncertainty, I mean, um, we need hope. And um, as Christians, we have hope. We have a living hope um, that the other side of this storm, of this life, we know ends on the shores of, of heaven and eternity with God. And, um, and so he invites you now. He invites you right now in this moment um, to receive him. If your eyes have been opened, if, if you just sense this, 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 uh, this tugging going, um, I, I want to believe. Well, I want to invite you to, to, to pray with me right now, if you would. If you would uh, mind it right where you're at, if you would just close your eyes. And if you're like, I, I want to do this, I want to receive Jesus as my Lord and Savior, then um, pray this prayer. This is a prayer. Something like this prayer is something Dr. Brian and myself both pray when we surrendered our lives to Jesus. And um, we were made new. Our sins were washed away. We were forgiven. And um, we began uh, a, in a new relationship with our creator through Jesus Christ. So um, would you close your eyes with me? Um, and would you, would you pray this? Would you pray this prayer with me? Say, Jesus, I believe that you live the life that I was supposed to live, but I couldn't. And that Jesus, you, you died the death that I deserved to die. You were buried, and on the third day you rose. I believe that. And today, I receive you as my Lord and Savior. I receive your love and your forgiveness into my life today. I receive you as, as my way to God the Father. I receive you into my heart. Come into my heart, Jesus. Come into my heart, Forgive me and save me in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You know, if you pray that prayer, we would, we would love to connect with you. You can go, um, if you're watching here on Facebook, you can, um, you know, uh, you can go to our uh, Facebook account. You can go to BethelChandler.com, uh, hit connect. We would love to send you a gift. We'd love to connect with you and uh, just know that this uh, Passion Week, this um, this week is going to be it's going to be new. It's going to be like no other week, as you have now begun an exciting new relationship with God, and He will never leave you or forsake you. He loves you, uh, and and um, He to to show you His plans for your life. And and the Bible tells us that His plans for us are full of hope, are full of hope, and and and. Um, a, a, a life that will have, have peace, 
even that goes beyond all understanding. And in this time, especially this time, we, we need a peace that goes beyond our understanding. And so thank you for uh, um, watching uh, tonight. Um, Dr. Brian, uh, thank you. Uh, thank you so much for the work that you do, your, your study and all that you do. And um, uh, we really appreciate your time and being with us from Seattle. We hope uh, very soon to have you uh, in person uh, with us here in Phoenix. Um, uh, and we're believing that that'll be um, not too far um, from today. So again, Dr. Brian, um, any last words as we, as we sign off? Uh, no, just thank you for your work for the kingdom. And I just pray that uh, God blesses your church and that even through the internet, you can reach many people's lives. Amen. Thank you, Dr. Brian. Thank you, everyone who tuned in this week. We've got a full, um, a full lineup of Passion Week activities. We have prayer at 714 in the morning, uh, 12 noon, uh, 714 at night. Uh, we have a Passover Seder. You can find out how to do have a Passover Seder on Wednesday. Uh, we have our Good Friday service. Um, it's going to be amazing. And then we have Easter services. So we'd love to see you. And uh, we are praying that you would have a blessed week. Uh, remember this, you are loved, you are blessed, and you are highly favored. Uh, we love you. Have a great week. Wow. Is your mind not blown? Well, as you're collecting the brain fragments off of the floor and placing them back into your mind, that was amazing. I want to encourage you, especially if this is your first instance with us here at Bethel, to go to BethelChandler.com and hit the connect button. And let us know what you thought about tonight. Whether you go to Bethel, whether you don't go to Bethel, we want to know how this benefited you. What was the biggest thing that you took away from this? What was something that you learned today that you did not know before? I know I learned like 25 things, 35 things that I did not know before. So please share that with us. We love hearing your testimonies. We love sharing your testimonies. We love magnifying Jesus through testifying. So please go to BethelChandler.com, find the connect button, and let us know how tonight impacted you. We will see you in the morning for our 714 a.m. prayer. We love you guys, and don't forget to share all this content. Good night.